Forgotten, Chapter 5, Ascent A long time ago, knowing that additional layers of robes or coats would merely slow her down, Princess Flurryheart merely opted for alteration spells that made the frigid air in her immediate area tolerable. The paths north out of the Crystal Empire towards the Crystal Mountains was the same arctic tundra as any other direction. That quickly gave way to Taiga as the landscape approached the northern range. About three miles out of the city, the paths split. The one to the left ascended far slower as it went east to Yakyakistan. The road had not been maintained in quite some time. But the other one went right for about a quarter mile before beginning the steep ascents up Mount Everhoof. The road was barely visible, having not been maintained in years. Right now, two questions were predominantly on the princess's mind. Why would Spike be sworn to secrecy concerning the whereabouts of a Dreamwalker, and why would they be all the way up here? No one ever came up here, at least not in the last century or so. Besides, she deemed the cave near the top of Mount Everhoof not being necessary to guard anymore, due to Grogar's bewitching bell no longer being up there. But, if whomever this Dreamwalker was didn't want to be disturbed, maybe that was the point. As the forest began to thin and the landscape changed to Alpine Tundra, Flurry took the opportunity to turn and look back at the city that she had spent a century and a half watching over, and more worriedly, the storm slowly twisting overhead. She really hoped this Dreamwalker could help her. Seeing the premonitions for themselves was undoubtedly better than her trying to interpret what she saw repeatedly every night for the past two weeks. As the trees began to thin out, more of the rising cliffs became visible. The snowfall began to decrease, but the wind picked up and she slowly got higher. When the path became visible again due to the lack of snowfall up here, Flurry noticed wagon ruts present in the ground. Recent ones. She didn't understand. There hasn't been a crystal guard posted up here for decades. What was a wagon coming up here for? It absolutely wasn't an easy pull. She followed the tracks further up the mountain as it slowly curved to the left around the bend as the trees continued to thin out. Sure enough, there was the old EUP hut, which had been there long before the Crystal Empire had reappeared. To her complete and utter surprise, it looked in good condition, like it had been continually maintained. She traced the tracks as they turned to curve right in front of the front door, then completed the turn back down the way it came. At first, she thought that a pony was coming up here to keep the cabin standing, making repairs as necessary, but then she saw smoke rising from the chimney on the right side of the roof. Some pony was here. Right now. Taking a deep breath, she made sure that her crown was on straight before continuing up the path to the cabin. Indeed, there was an axe embedded in the stump out front, with neatly stacked logs and a pile under the front window. Stepping up to the front door, she took a deep breath and knocked on it. There was nothing after that for a moment, but she couldn't hear much above the ambient howling of the wind. Twenty seconds later, she heard the door's deadbolt unlatch, and the old wooden door was pulled open with a creak. She wasn't sure what she was expecting, but it certainly wasn't a pony equal to her height, wearing a dark brown hooded cloak. They had a dark blue coat and a horn longer than you would typically see on fully mature unicorns. Princess Flurryhearts, you don't know how long I've waited to see you here on this doorstep, greeted the feminine voice that Flurry had not heard in decades. Flurryheart's eyes widened as she realized who was standing in front of her. Princess Aluna? Chapter 6 Departure Hitch gave an exasperated sigh as his squad approached the Scouticus Maximus with him. Oh no, come on guys, I'm afraid you can't go along. The climate we're going into isn't that great for seagulls and crabs, but I'm counting on you to keep an eye on my subs while I'm gone, alright? Seriously, if they try anything remotely fishy, please, run them out of town. The two seagulls and crabs shared looks of disappointment, but gave salutes and began slowly moving down the street towards the police station. Sprout had pulled the vehicle out of the rear basement access of Canterlogic, so they could avoid taking it through all the crowded city streets. The planned route would keep them largely on the west coast, taking them around the Smoky Mountains, and then roughly on a northeast trajectory. This was going largely off a Zip's aerial recon that her team had done in the weeks beforehand. Pip was doing a walk around the vehicle while livestreaming, and Sprout was making the final checks before getting ready to go. Sunny was in the passenger seat going over a checklist of all the food that they had packed, Zip was stretching her wings, keeping them limbered up as she would be spending much of the trip airborne until they reached colder weather. And then Izzy was assisting in loading up the last crates of food. When all that was done, Izzy took a magical hold of the tailgate, pushed it up, and latched it into place. Alright, food's all loaded! Izzy announced. The spare tires took about a third of the space in the bed, the crates of food took another third, and the rest was empty crates, ready to hold any artifacts that they found. They had arranged the crates so that they could be sat on semi-comfortably, as sitting in the bed until they hit the Arctic would be the best way to get fresh air. 
All right, every pony. I'll be back when we're en route to the Crystal Empire. Pip announced, giving a smile and wave before cutting the stream on her phone. All right, one last thing. Came the voice of Toots, walking out of one of Canterlogic's rear entrances, carrying a trio of what looked to be devices of some kind on telescoping poles. What are those? Hitch asked. These are long-range emergency transponders. You should only need one, but, you know, redundancy. Just stick it in the ground, extend it, and hit the button on top. We'll have someone here monitoring this frequency at all times. Toots told them, and got securely placed in the back of the bed with Izzy's help, as Phyllis also came out. Sprout, come down and give me a hug before you all get underway. She told him, trotting up to the driver's side as Hitch got on board. <sighs> Mommy... Sprout whined, as his cheeks tinted red as he had been trying to show a little more maturity the last few months. He climbed down out of the cab, stepped up to his mom, and she pulled him into a tight hug. I'm very proud of you, Sugar Cube. You've put a lot of work these last couple of months, and this is the farthest that you have traveled without me. Just remember, drive safe. You've got five other ponies counting on you to get them there safely, alright? Phyllis asked. I will, I promise. Sprout told her, returning the hug. With that, Phyllis released him, and Sprout climbed back into the cab. As he hopped into the back along with Zip, and once Pip climbed inside, that made all six on board, and Sprout started up the engine. Alright, see everyone in a couple of weeks! Sprout announced. The six ponies gave the nearby factory staff a wave goodbye, as Sprout pulled on the air horn twice before gently pushing the throttle forward, and the Scouticus Maximus started climbing the first hill. Phyllis felt her throat tighten as the vehicle and six ponies on board crested the first hill and slowly left her sight. Is everything alright, Phyllis? Toots asked, coming up to her side. The factory director swallowed a lump in her throat. I'm fine. This will be the farthest away that he's been from me in his entire life. And for the longest amount of time. I just hope that'll be safe. He will, I'm sure of it. Toots reassured his boss. He's gotten a better head lately, and he's got the other five to help him out. <sighs> yeah, you're right. I'm probably worrying too much. Phyllis resigned. Hey, that's part of being a parent. Now, if you'll excuse me, ma'am, me and Sweets have a police station to run. That letter isn't about to patrol for itself. Part of me was slightly expecting that machine to actually give in on the first hill that they climbed. But then again, I shouldn't have thought about that because it's a little too cliche. Anywho, let's get on to our unique donators. Top donators are 630, J10 Man, Darkseid, Only One Thing, and Saru Orion. Raiden, Narwhals, Black Moonheart, Pastel Skies, Austin Rollins, Stu Hex, Sword Brother and Mordred, Omicron Library, Will Chris, Twinkie Hudzaza, Riot Soul, Iron Sky, Badass Waffle, Shadow Moon, and many more glamorous people. Thank you all so much for watching this video and live life to the fullest.